Right, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the State of the Market. Uh, and I have to say I've been doing this for quite a long time. I've been in business for about 30 years. And I don't think I've ever known a time with quite so much political and possibly um, economic uh, uncertainty. And I think for me the biggest surprise is actually how remarkably stable the property market has been, bar a few hiccups uh, in things like the prime market. Um, this, when this level of uncertainty kicks in, normally this would affect the property market quite dramatically and it hasn't anywhere near as much as uh, I would um, expect. Two reasons for that, I think, where we do have some stability is people still need to put a roof over their head and still believe it's a good investment. Um, and secondly, the interesting thing is, of course, we've had uh, reasonable stability on the financial side um, and particularly the low cost of entry into housing. So that's kind of my thoughts. Um, but far more important than me, I have my esteemed panel here. I believe that's what you're supposed to call them. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each one and then I'm going to go back to them. And rather than do some rambling presentation for five minutes, which is what everybody did last year, including me, uh, I've just asked them to suggest three things about the market, the state of the market, that you might find uh, useful um, to know. And then really what we want to do is hand over to you. Um, so start thinking of questions. Otherwise, I will pluck you from the audience to ask something. Because uh, a panel is rubbish if you all come here and just sit and listen. OK? So um, on my far left, we've got Tony uh, Gimple. He's from Less Tax for Landlords. One of the things I ha did do, because I thought it would be a fun Friday, is I put everybody's names into Google just to see what comes up. And actually, the only thing that comes up is Tony. Um, there is no <laughs> other Tony Gimble in the whole wide world as far as Google is concerned. <laughs> so, um, and Tony's very much our tax expert here, which is if you are not into tax at this moment in time, you'd better get into it now as far as I'm concerned. Um, next to Tony, we have David Smith. Um, David is a joy to put into Google because apparently he has I every... My parents. <laughs> every single profession that's around, but the two top ones that came up were a structural engineer. I could, I was, I could see you doing that. Um, and also a sculptor. No. <laughs> Solicitor, sculptor, I'm not sure those two would work. Um, <laughs> but uh, an English cricketer was the other one. Is that that one? You've got quite the poise for an English cricketer. Well, I mean, solicitors and cricket, so long, there's a long standing. There we go. Yeah, there we mind. go. So, Sorry. other other possible careers for our panellists. And he is Policy Director for the Residential Landlord Association and partner for Anthony uh, Gold Solicitors. And I tell you what, I've known Dave for a long time and I would actually describe him as a legal legend and I genuinely mean that. So we are, <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> that is not maybe on Google, but it should be. And we are very, very lucky to have him here today. And if you don't, one of the things you must keep up to date with is the legals. Um, as well as the tax side of things, and David's blogs are absolutely brilliant because I understand them. <coughs> and when that comes to legals, that is not always easy to do. Next to me on my right, I have David Cox. I feel like should be Sir David Cox, no? I won't turn it down. <laughs> 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 <Taking ideas. laughs> so David is apparently either, according to Google, he's either an artist or a footballer. And I have to say, I cannot imagine you in either of those circumstances. Because I've got two left feet and yes. I'm about as creative as... Uh, I don't think I could do either well, he, of those He's shapes. so creative, you can't even dance, you can't even follow that through, <laughs> can you? So, uh, however... My painting skills are second to none. However, there we go, they're not. <laughs> have you ever painted? You see me draw things on boards. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, more importantly for us today, uh, David is the Chief Executive of Arla. Uh, and I've, uh, there's so many acronyms, but basically letting agents, so he looks after the letting agents. Uh, in the past, I think both of you, both my Davids have been barristers. Is that right? I'm not, no, I've always, no? always been a solicitor. Oh, right, there Thanks. we go. I trained as a barrister. You've got to question what you put on Google these days, really. Um, mm. People write looking on <laughs> But what I do also know is that David uh, works incredibly hard. So there are some people that go out and they kind of do their day job. He doesn't because uh, David is one of my, I call him my night buddies. He doesn't know this, by the way. He's getting very, very <laughs> nervous at the moment. But basically, if you send emails out at 11 o'clock at night, of which I do a lot, basically, David is one of the ones that always responds immediately. <laughs> so this is very much not a day job. And he does a massive amount for letting agents, landlords, and indeed tenants. So uh, again, um, when we do a thank you at the end, these guys are working very hard on your behalf not just with their day job, with uh, what they do outside. And last, but absolutely by no means least, we have the lovely Richard Blanco. Now, you come up as a poet, but when I read on, that is not far off. 
because in actual fact, Richard was uh, in theatre. Do you still do it now? Theatre um, and a dancer. Yes, I trained as a contemporary dancer, actually, yep. Do we That's right. <laughs> Get up and do it. No, I, I, I haven't choreographed anything I, for I today, I'm afraid. Like, <laughs> I, th I thought I'd ask, anyway, yes. um, that, uh, uh, about that. But again, Richard, he's London landlord now, probably because theatre and dance didn't pay <laughs> brilliantly. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Rather do telly. <laughs> that's, that's fair enough. Um, so he's a London landlord, so he's a really experienced landlord, really gets this uh, localised market. And he do, he's a London landlord representative for the NLA. Yes. Yes. So we have everybody covered um, here today. So we are very lucky to have everybody here. Uh, so Tony, should we start with you? Your yeah. three bullet pointed, bullet pointed Tony, okay, things that you think everybody needs to know about the state of the market from a tax perspective. Right. So. Speak up. I shall speak up. I shall project. Project, please. Richard, lessons from Rada, please. <laughs> right. All the. So, if any of you were at my talk, you'd, you'd have probably actually heard me, so I'm going to repetition for emphasis. You have, if you haven't realised, some 60% of landlords will have higher tax bills as a result of sitting on their hands. In fact, that, that, that their bills will go up significantly and that will start to come back and bite you very, very quickly. Second bullet point. This is, uh, and this is the most disturbing part, is six out of ten. So actually, no, it's, no, it's more than that. Sorry, it's what, one in eight landlords fail to consult a tax specialist. And two out of ten are trying to do it themselves. Now that, once again, will grow teeth and come back and bite you at some point. Property tax is difficult. It's not like running a corner shop. The third point, and probably even more important than the previous two combined, is traditional professions, particularly accounting, will simply assume you know what you're doing and only answer the question you've asked. Now that is dangerous, because that affects you now acting under your instruction and won't check what you know in the first place. So if it all goes wrong, what will they say? You asked the question, I answered it. And I think the main point is, is that you can, you can help people mitigate tax before. Yes. What you can't do if we have a new budget and something happens, that's it, you've lost your opportunity. Yeah. So it is really, really important. Um, to make sure, I always say at Property Investor Show, please keep up with the legals. And secondly, do not try and do tax yourself, certainly from the start. Thank you, Tony. Pleasure. David. Three legal points, I see. Three things. State that of just the market, didn't know. you can legalise them if you wish. Okay, I'll, I'll stick to three legal things. Um, free, freelance. The first thing I would say is that people are very excited about the government getting rid of Section 21, unsurprisingly. Um, uh, but, but, but there's a long way between a government announcement and a consultation and actually passing a piece of legislation through Parliament that's got kind of other stuff to do um, to get rid of Section 21. Um, and the prospects of that being on the statute book before early to mid-2022 are practically zero. And the prospects of it being on the statute book at all are not that high. Um, particularly having been to the Conservative Party conference this week and mm. spoken to people who, who, who don't rate it that high. So um, I've heard a lot of landlords go around saying, I'm going to serve Section 21 right now. And I'm seeing on Twitter, I was already serving Section 21 before it goes away. That would be really premature. Um, so if you're thinking of leaving the market, then fair enough. But just don't assume that, that just because the government has been consult on something, it's going to actually happen tomorrow. Well, it certainly won't happen tomorrow. The second thing is I will talk about licensing. I think one of the things that is changing at the moment is, is as the government's made changes to various room size rules and things, that there's a, there's a continued push towards more and more and more selective licensing and quite targeted selective licensing schemes. I see far too many people falling foul of those. You really must be aware of what your local authority are doing. Almost every local authority has a landlord information forum. Um, you really should sign up. It's the best opportunity you will ever have to go and drink cheap wine um, <laughs> with local authority officers. Um, but more to the point, they will then 
put you on their, their lists and we'll make sure you're actually being updated with what they're doing. You'll get early access to consultations. Um, and the third thing is I see, I'm seeing a really too many scams at the moment. I see far too many cases of very, very dubious letting agents, not ALA members, I hasten to add. Um, and or rigs. Or, or, or members of any professional <laughs> body, fairly obviously. Um, uh, and far too many very dubious rent to rent schemes. So if someone's saying to you, I'm going to charge you an amount that's way less than the, than the market, or I'm going to pay you a full market rate and guarantee you no void periods, it's too good to be true. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. So there are perfectly valid cheap letting agents, there are perfectly valid rent to rent schemes and rent to rent providers, but they are not all valid. And the level of protection to landlords if those things go south is very low. So it's really important to just think carefully about the kind of schemes you're getting involved in and what you're investing your money in. Okay, that's great. David. Uh, firstly, I'm going to echo everything that David has just said. I agree with him uh, in, in relation to absolutely everything. Um, Must be right. Absolutely. Uh, mm. And I'm going to continue the theme of crappy letting agents. Um, <laughs> So, as the agent representative on the panel, uh, there are too many poor letting agents. Um, how many here actually use, or have at any point used a letting agent? The majority of you, exactly. Um, some are great, all the members are great. Some are terrible. And when they are managing what is probably your largest asset after the home in which you live, for a tenant it's their home, should it not be your right and your tenant's right that they have somebody who knows what they're doing? And at the moment, you can open your doors at nine o'clock in the morning, and as long as you've joined a redress scheme, you are perfectly lawfully allowed to continue to operate as a letting agent with no knowledge, no skills, no training whatsoever. It's why we've been campaigning for a long time, and therefore number one is uh, the government has now committed to regulating property agents, estate agents, letting agents, and auctioneers. Um, all ALA members have to have a qualification at a level three, which is akin to an A level. We are expecting shortly the government to announce that all letting agents will have to have a level three qualification and license to practice from an independent regulator. Now, just as with the section 21 changes that David was talking about, it's not going to come in overnight. I'm not actually expecting it to come in until the middle of the next decade. Um, but it's something that Kate, you and I have worked on, everybody here has worked very hard to make sure that you as landlords and your tenants are not being caught by unscrupulous letting agents. Whilst I'm on that particular topic, there's not much you can do about ROPA, uh, the regulation of property agents now, unless you use an ARL or RICS member or one of the other professional bodies. Uh, but what all letting agents have had to do since the 1st of April this year is join a client money protection scheme. Now, it's a great way of landlords being able to tell whether their agent, one, knows what they're doing, and two, are complying with the law. So, there are six government-approved client money protection schemes. All letting agents have to be a member of one. What they do is if the agent goes bust or runs off with your money, the schemes give you your money back. They are protection almost exclusively designed for landlords. It also covers tenants who haven't had their deposits protected or holding deposits, etc. Um, but it is about you getting your money back if your agent runs off with it. Um, if your agent is not displaying their client money protection certificate prominently in their office and on their website, they are legally required to join a scheme. Therefore, if they're not doing that, what other laws are they not complying with? So use that as a barometer of whether or not your agent is a good agent, is a competent agent. And if they haven't got CMP, don't touch them with a barge pole because you could lose thousands and thousands of pounds in rent if they run off with it. Um, Arla has had 12 situations like that in the last 35 years where one of our members have done it. We've returned the money in every occasion, but the last major situation, they closed the office on the Thursday night. One business partner opened the office on the Friday morning to find that his colleague had taken 900,000 pounds out of the client account, out of the business account, and moved to Northern Cyprus overnight. If those had not wow. been Arla members, and all those landlords would have lost that money. So make sure that your land letting agent does have CMP and make sure they are displaying it. And if they're not, don't use them. Final point, Tenant Fees Act. Um, the Tenant Fees Act has come in. It's not just applicable to letting agents. It is applicable to landlords. 
um, and do consider some of the sort of the slightly more technical aspects. And the one that I'm going to pick up on is content insurance. If you mandate content insurance, that is a prohibited payment. If you say you should have content insurance, I would recommend you go to this content insurance provider, that's fine. But if you mandate content insurance, that will be classed as a prohibited payment under the Act and you will be liable to the £5,000 fine. Okay. And one thing I would say on the CMP side, if you think the average tenancy now is about four years, so it is, I hope it comes in a lot quicker, the ROPA um, regulation mm, than yes. David does, and I should be pushing very hard for that. But why on earth would you go with an agent that isn't already self-qualified if your tenancy is going to run for four years and if in two, three years' time that agent is not going to be in business because they're going to be breaking the law? It's a really nuts scenario, but we are very reliant on you to make sure that you only work with the good agents. And Arla, Ricks, other um, organisations have worked very, very hard to show you a badge to deliver you good letting agents. So I'm going to be a little harder than David and say, if you go with a road letting agent, do you know what? It is your fault because there's been an awful lot of work done to make sure that there are good agents out there from uh, organisations like this. So there's kind of no excuses. A bit like cowboy builders, that's another little thing about mine. You can find a good builder these <coughs> days. So do, do check. There are no excuses for going with rogue uh, letting agents at all. Richard, what yes. nuggets have you got well, for us? To follow on from that, I mean, our research at the NLA tells us that 43% of uh, landlords in our survey are regular users of letting agents. But of course, a lot of landlords these days will manage their own properties as I do. And um, our research also tells us that 32% of landlords say that letting agents have put up their fees recently because of the tenant fees. Uh, ban. So I think I'm really interested to see uh, what's going to happen in the next few years in terms of the letting agent market. We have seen some consolidation with larger agents taking over smaller agents and um, you know whether there'll be more migration towards online kind of uh, you know 99 pounds to get advertised on right move and that sort of thing. I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, my second point was just following on on the section 21 um, abolition issue. Um, I hope, I think as much as David does, that it slips down the agenda and that Boris being more, a bit more free market than Theresa May and certainly now we've got rid of Toby Lloyd as the special advisor who was the former head of policy at Shelter, that this will sort of fall by the wayside. My concern is that uh, Shelter and all of the housing charities are desperate for Section 21 to be abolished. It's also its Labour Party policy, so I feel like um, the writing might be on the wall. I really hope it isn't, and I hope it, this goes away as an issue. We've done some research with Capital Economics to help us lobby against it, and we were at the Tory party conference. Um, and uh, the modelling that they've done for us, they think that the private rented sector could shrink by 20% if Section 21 is abolished. And, and also there'll be a 59% reduction in the amount of properties available for tenants on benefits because, of course, landlords will become increasingly choosy um, and that rents could go up as well. We think in 13% of, of homes uh, in the PRS sector, rents could go up. So my third point was on the market and what's happening to the market. I'm very interested in how, um, you know, we've had uh, better yields and more growth in the Midlands and the North recently, and we've had uh, prices gently drifting down in London and the East and the South East. And we're starting to see that growth sort of slow now in the Midlands and the North. And so at some point, I think we'll see a switch round of that cycle, um, wh which is what generally happens. But of course, it's very hard to know because of Brexit. And what, because uh, if we have a no deal Brexit, if we have a, a deal, or if we don't Brexit, there will probably be three different outcomes on the market. I think a no deal Brexit would cause the market to slip further. Um, a deal would probably cause it to carry on more or less as it is at the moment, sort of chuntering along, probably slipping down a bit. And if Brexit is abolished, then I think the market could rebound a bit. The global recession, of course, is, is a potential too, so that could impact on things. So lots, lots of uncertainty there, as we know, lots of political uncertainty. I uh, think I stick my neck out recently and have said that I think possibly interest rates could come down by a quarter of a percent. And I had a dilemma of whether to go with a tracker or a fix recently. 
and so I've gone with a track which is slightly cheaper than the Fix. I noticed some of the lenders are making trackers a bit more expensive than Fixes now, which is again is another hint that in, they might be worrying that interest rates are going to come down and so they need to adjust their products accordingly. But um, the Bank of England has certainly suggested that the, the rate coming down is more likely than it, than it was you know, uh, re more uh, in, in recent months. So I think that would be interesting to see the impact that could have on the market, of course. Right, well that's everybody else's view. Have we got any views from the audience or questions? And bear in mind, seeing as you're coming back to us, you'll need to shout, because <laughs> I am slightly there. Yes? Hi, um, I did have an, somebody approach me to rent an apartment that I have on this rent to rent thing. I found it very odd question in the first place, and I sent back a question with the letting agent, who I do think are very good, and, um, but I was surprised that they put this um, to me. So basically, so you had somebody approach you via the agent yeah. to do rent to rent. Yeah, and um, you know they've been fine on other, you know, on other towns before. They've been <coughs> great good. But this time, I said all I said was, well, I really need to check my mortgage, um, my buy to let mortgage, and whether it would be covered. Um, and then I never heard anything back. From them. I did. Uh, I sent a message back saying, well, could you ask her more detail? Is that exactly what she would do with my property? How is she going to fill the property and pay my rents? And it was guaranteed, like you just said. And when I sent that question back through the agent, she was out of the country. Uh, was Whoa. it te was it tempting to do it, or were you were you just intrigued to find I a little was, more? No, I was do I was I had my guard up really. Yeah, good for I you. Had my good for you. Up. I wanted to tempt in long term, but I didn't have mm. to worry. I would say several things about rent to rent. There are definitely good quality rent to rent deals out there. So don't I'm, I don't I'm not I don't want to tar the whole all the whole rent to rent market with a brush by any means. There there are some very good people doing very very reasonable and fair things, but there are things to watch out for. There are agents who are receiving a commission from the tenants. So they are effectively carrying out a secret commission and they're basically working both sides. That's not really <coughs> lawful, but some agents are definitely doing that. Because so with the fee with the fees that they have to, does it come under the... No, because um, oh, it, it's, it, it, because it's a company okay. and, and the, in the Let's Not an AST it's exempt. So anyway. normally agents now have to um, yeah. say if they're getting a fee. So if you're buying a house through them and they ask you to use their legal company, they have to <coughs> declare what commission they get. Sure. And but what but David's there saying there is, is you can't there do not, that. Not, not all agents are doing that. So they're, they're getting a fee effectively from the tenant as well as taking a fee from you. So there is that risk. I'm not saying your agent's doing that or any particular agent's doing that, but I've certainly seen examples. Um, the other difficulty is you've got to bear in mind how rent to renters make money. I mean, essentially, they are proposing to pay you less money than they can make for the property. Now, that either means they pay you less than the market rent, or they engage in what I tend to call rent arbitrage, i.e. they rent your single flat and chop it up in some way that's going to make more money. Now, that might be by renting it as a series of roomlets, as an HMO, or by short letting it on Airbnb as, as a set of holiday lets. Now, that, that in itself creates problems. Almost, uh, not every, but the majority of buy to let mortgages prohibit HMO use. Um, most people think that means licensed HMO use, but that's not what they say. They just say no HMOs. Uh, so letting it to three people sharing is going to violate the terms of your mortgage. Now, you can get mortgages that allow HMOs, but they're specific. Every mortgage prohibits short letting. Um, either implicitly, directly, or, 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 or because they prohibit something else that's going to catch you out. If it's a flat, literally every flat lease I've ever seen prohibits short letting because they say no business use, and short letting is a business use. Yeah. Um, and of course, if you're in London, it's planning breach anyway, uh, which is prohibited both by your flat lease and by your mortgage and by your insurer. Yeah. Um, so the thing I'm always very, very immediately... Apart from that, it's fine. <laughs> Apart from that, yeah. That's <laughs> so, the, so the first question to ask, for a rent-to-rent -rent deal is, is, is how are you making your money? Um, now, it might be they're just paying you a bit less than the market rent and you're getting a no-void period for the next three and a half years, and, and, and fair enough. Uh, it might well be that they're uh, going to use it as an HMO and you're okay with that. It might be that they're going to short-let it and, and where you are is fine, but they have to be honest about it. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I would say is look carefully at the contract. A lot of rent-to-rent uh, -rent deals have their own contracts, which is fine, but some of them say they're ASTs when they're not um, because they've been presented by crazy people. Um, some of them have, have very creative clauses, like, for example, if they don't pay you the rent, you can't evict them. Certainly seen that a fair few times. So the forfeiture clauses are just scrubbed out. If you don't have it, you can't use it. I've seen a fair few where you think the tenancy is going to end after three years, but it just doesn't, provided they've got someone in the property they can keep going forever, which may be a surprise to you. 
Um, and of course, none of these are protected by consumer protection rights because you're not a consumer. You're letting them the property, they're a business, so there's no consumer protection stuff here. You can't do unfair terms or any of that stuff. So there's some real, real questions to be asked about the contract. And the last thing I would say is check out the business. So many of these people are limited companies that were set up yesterday. Um, if I wanted to rent, uh, well, if I rent an office uh, from a large office provider, I have a limited company that was set up yesterday, they're not going to rent it to me. And if they do, they'll say, we want a personal guarantee from you. I, mean, I have this issue. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I rent offices. We give personal guarantees all the time for our <coughs> office premises. Um, but all of these rent-to-rent -rent guys are setting up limited companies that were set up yesterday that have no trading history, no filed accounts, and are apparently going to pay you. I um, think the bigger issue here, Kate, is that uh, people are chasing bigger yields, and it's yes. partly driven by the PRA changes with stress tests on mortgages, so people are having to show more rent to be able to borrow what they need for that particular property. Uh, people are also, because of the low yields in London and the South East, they're starting to look at HMOs, they're starting to look up north. You know, uh, uh, there was a report out re uh, this week which said that um, an increasing number of properties are being let where the living room is a bedroom mm. now. Mm -hmm. and that's of course becoming much more common in London. I mean I really stick to my guns with my three and four bed houses. I keep the living room. I want it to be a nice property. I'm happy to take less rent. I'd rather have really nice tenants that look after the property and because I've bought well and bought in a place where I've got capital growth uh, and so on, um, that my, my business is fine and I don't, I don't need to max everything out and I think that's a really important value that mm. I'd like to mm. share with David, you. David, any thoughts on the letting agent side and the rent to rent, are you coming across that much? It is something, we're coming across it actually more as a problem rather than a solution. Um, there are, and I would say there are a few very good rent to rent letting agents that actually specialise in the rent to rent market. Um, and um, they'll be Arla members. Yeah, okay. and we have. I can think of at least half a dozen uh, that are Arla members and operate to high professional standards. So let's not tarnish all of them with the same brush. Having said that, we are increasingly seeing um, properties exactly what David has just been talking about. Um, they are rented as if they were one person. Um, the letting agent goes round to do the regular inspection to find that there are six people living in it. Um, it is very difficult then to get them out because even though they are not your tenant, they are permitted occupiers under the property uh, under the, and under the law. Therefore, you have to go through the standard eviction proceedings. You can't just change the lock. So one of the things we have noticed, if it looks too good to be true, it is. If somebody is turning up um, in a very smart suit and a smart car in an like area... You. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, in an area that uh, you would not expect them to want to rent in, shall we say, uh, and they're offering you six months rent up front, that should be a massive flag um, of why do they want the property. Because it could be rent to rent. We're also seeing, okay, we're really confusing people today, <laughs> but we're also seeing a lot of cannabis factories, uh, meth labs, and other illegal situations, shall we say. Um, it's something we've actually been doing quite a lot of work with the Home Office recently on county lines. Um, and whilst it used to be London where they turned the properties mm. into the cannabis factories, um, they are, they're, they're now creating entire, now supply, yeah, entire supply chains, shall we say. Um, and it's actually outside of London in more rural areas. So if you've got properties in rural areas where people are offering you rent up front <coughs> and those sort of situations, be very, very careful because they may be turning your property into a drug den and then using children to traffic the drugs from Reading and the home counties particularly uh, into London. Okay. Um, and it is, it is a major issue and I'm sure you hear on a regular basis on the news about the Mets County Lines initiative. So on that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> have we another question? <laughs> yes, please. Actually related to this. Okay. Um, mentioned rent to rent uh, that there are some good businesses out there what should a, a startup plan rent to rent business do to be compliant with everything it needs to be compliant and how should it run uh, you know, how should it set it up set the business up in terms of compliance with the various okay. Okay. So and to just to repeat so everybody hears um, so we've talked about mm. you being the landlord being offered rent to rent and what this lady is asking is well if I want to set up a rent to rent business what do I as how, what, do, what do I have to do to be one of the good guys so yes. yeah, I, I get a lot of clients 
who want to set up rent to rent businesses or want to improve the quality of their business. Things I will say is have a business plan. Yeah. Far too many rent to rent businesses don't have very good business plans and they fold because they haven't anticipated all the costs. Uh, you need to have a good quality agreement, both upstream uh, with whoever's supplying the property and downstream with people who are occupying the property, which clearly sets out who's doing what. Mm -hmm. Is that a management agreement? It's not an well, no, no, it's a tenancy agreement. I mean, this is, this is the other thing. Be very clear about what you're doing. A lot of rent-to-rent -rent businesses are saying that they're, they're a letting agent and it's a management agreement. It's not. You're a tenant of somebody else and a landlord. So you're, you're in the middle. You're a middleman. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other thing is you've got to get your licensing mm -hmm. um, position squared away. Far too many rent-to-rent -rent businesses just don't get licenses. Don't, in some cases, don't even know they need licenses. And that just causes just chaos all down the road. Licenses from the council? Yeah, local authority yeah. licensing scheme. And so any tax, tax implications quickly on rent to rent because I do want to move on to other topics? Effectively, it's a trading business. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but the point, point here, it's a business. Why are you doing it in the first place? Have you got a plan? Who have you talked to? Have you referenced? Are the agreements enforceable? Treat it like any other business and then you'll be on much firmer footing than just you know, wet finger in the air or rent to rent, I can make some money. Yeah, there are far too many people on the internet with this sort of yeah. make money out of property, no money down, you'll make a million. They've all got, uh, if you notice, they all have pictures <laughs> of themselves leaning against the posh car. Always. Do you know what? Which they I usually don't own. Yes. <laughs> that, that was one thing I was going to yeah. say. There was a thing a few years ago, because basically we've all been here for quite a long time. So what we know is that every sort of three or four years, somebody invents a new way to come out with, to make money out of property. Some do it well, some don't do it well. And there was a rumour that some guys used to go around and uh, they'd have their picture in the car and everything leaning on them, but they just rented them for the night. Yeah. Uh, that was it. But uh, it's, it, it suckered <laughs> people in, sadly. When you said licensing, do you mean HMO licenses? Well, I mean HMO them? also. Yeah selective licensing from the yeah, respective sure. local authority and and or planning consent for what you're planning to do with property. We have a disagreement to my right. Can I slightly disagree with David well, about, but about also simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> not going to lift that down am I? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ask David what he drives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so David made the, the point that uh, you are a tenant as a right to re rent to rent. You're absolutely right but you are effectively acting though as an agent and you will rent to rent will be covered under ROPA you will be classed as a letting agent under ROPA and technically under the client money protection regulation they will be classed as an agent no no I well. don't think they are covered by, by um, client money protection because they're not holding uh, client money it's, 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 it's they're not clients don't I don't agree with that sure though. Do okay we'll, we'll disagree about this later we're tennising this one in any event you, you know, one of the key things you do want to do is make sure that you know how to manage property or the laws that are required to uh, to comply with in uh, around managing property um, because it's not a simple task. There are what, 165 different pieces of legislation, 400 sets of regulations did the RLA come out with recently? Yeah. Well, um, the number changes every week. Well, indeed, Depends if you indeed. add Wales or not. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a huge amount of law that you need to know in order to lawfully and effectively manage property. So yes, David is absolutely right, you are technically the tenant under the law, but in what you are doing, you are effectively managing a property on behalf of so the landlord. Well, I, but I think well, you, what... You need to be clear. I mean, no, no, hold here. on, hold on. What you need to do is get proper legal advice from experts and proper advice from the likes of Arla because this is not something, oh, it's a bit like tax, and hopefully Tony are with me here. I always get asked, what tax will I have to pay, Kate? I refuse to answer it. It's not that I don't know the answer, it's just that if I gave you an answer today, and three months down the line things have changed, you have no idea. So the answer is, if you're setting up a rent-to-rent -rent business, you must get expert legal advice and expert tax advice because it's a business. And I think that's where a lot of people get away <coughs> and do a lot of things wrong in property because they're trying to do it without that expert help. And that's where I see people um, fall down. So we're going to leave that one there. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just to make sure it's me. It's like uh, Jen was talking earlier about um, letting agents in and the Some goes wrong, they haven't checked 
much exposure is it to the person who actually owns the property? Oh, that's a good question. So mm. I like this. So this is about if I let a letting agent manage a yes. property, yeah. basically what you're saying is how much responsibility do they take and how much responsibility am I left with? Is that right? <laughs> that's also one of the most difficult. Like yeah, sure. that's one of the most difficult questions. Um, I can't have two Davids and then one of you disagrees with the other. That's really complicated <laughs> to write Technically, landlords are responsible. So if you are prosecuted, it is the landlord that will be prosecuted nine times out of ten, not the letting agent. There are, I accept, certain situations. We'll go over for to example. David for his views. Um, but generally, uh, legislation writes the landlord will, the landlord won't. The landlord will be liable if you do or you don't do what you're allowed to or not allowed to do. Therefore, as the primary responsibility, legal compliance sits with the landlord. Now, the letting agent, so say a letting agent doesn't do something and you as the landlord get pro gets prosecuted. Now, I would say, firstly, you will have a right of redress to their uh, redress scheme for compensation. You will also have a business contract where although you will be liable you should be able to then sue them for your losses but that is a lot of work and you may lose um, and it is why we are saying that letting agents need to know what they are doing so that they don't forget to do a right to rent check for example that's you get a three thousand pound fine if your letting agent hasn't done that for every tenant that they haven't done it on you've got our uh, uh, if they haven't served the how to rent guide, you have problems with section 21, regaining possession of the property. If they haven't done the gas safety certificate, um, when they've said they would. All of those you are liable for, but they have contracted and you've and charged you for doing the work. Um, and Richard, yeah. so if I'm a member of the RLA or the NLA, mm. then will your legal helpline help with stuff like this? Yes. Just, just seeing what other protection there is, because you're right, it's a costly thing if you've got to do yourself. They will. I mean, I would make the case, I was going to say to Kate, for not using agents, um, because I think one of the problems, and, you know, let's have some disagreements on the panel, otherwise it's a bit dull, isn't it? But... Um, <laughs> That's, you can um, have constructive disagreements, no fights. <laughs> That's what I said the other day. You know, the thing, obviously, an agent will take, you know, if they're managing in London, it will be uh, something like 12%, maybe 15% of your uh, rent. Also, I think when you use an agent, sometimes you de-skill yourself because you don't bother finding out what the regulations are and what's going on because uh, you just assume the agent's going to be able to do it for you. Now, if you want to join the NLA or the RLA and use the advice line, you get a regular... Um, a journal as well that keeps you up to date with everything um, and certainly if your properties are nearby then I think there's no reason why you shouldn't try and manage them yourself and but, use. But even as somebody that's starting out that doesn't know the 400 rules and regulations 160 laws I mean that, is, honestly, a, that I would, is a massive No task. I would say yes This Kate, is where I yeah. agree with mm. Kate on this one. Right. At least do it for the first time so that you can no, use No I don't agent. agree. What I would learn say what is you need to learn. No no no. But, no, most no. but that's where the accidental no. landlords No are proper, I think you do it? the landlords foundation course at the NLA which is a one day course which gives you a very <laughs> thorough understanding. You turned it into a sales pitch. You could <laughs> also <laughs> do. Did you hear that? Yeah. How much does that cost Richard? I don't know much. You go yeah, to I, landlord meetings, I, I, you meet other people, etc. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I really think skill right, up. Skill up the road, David to I, David. I would take a more medium position between both these positions. But actually, <laughs> David, David and I are not going to disagree. The first point to bear in mind is landlords are 100% liable for the actions of their agent. At common law, they always have been, yeah. and they always will be. Yeah. Um, basically, the government has introduced sets of legislation over the years that, make, that fix agents more directly with liability but the traditional common law position was agents could turn around and say, I'm just the agent, go see the landlord, it's not my problem. Um, which was like the cool thing about being an agent in a legal sense. Mm. Um, that's been cut down, but it's still the case that landlords are basically 100% liable for the actions of their agents. They may also have redress against their agent, but if their agent's a limited company and is currently residing in northern Cyprus, that's not going to get you very far. And the reality is when agents go down, they go down and there's yeah, almost nothing there.
so, fast, don't they? And they go fast, yeah. yeah but because, also remember, Kate, that the most valuable asset in my business is my relationship with my tenants. Yeah. Because I do a check-in with them, because I do an induction meeting with them, I build up a relationship with them that means they're much less likely to go into arrears, much less likely to trash the property, more likely to stay five or six years, which means I won't get voids and I won't have to find yeah. new tenants. So, so, so but I, if you're I a I would rule, tend to say so there's, nothing wrong with using, there's nothing wrong with yeah. using an agent, but I always say trust and check. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, and absolving all of your responsibility Sorry. to the agent is a mistake. Just say David, because you've got 50-50 chance. Richard. 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 <laughs> Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Richard said, I agree 100% of what you said. Visit them, it's just like a road. But if you're one of these distance one or you're going to be one of them, yeah. it's difficult to do that. Of course. So, you want to do your due diligence as much as you can. Then you've got the wrong agent. Story. It's a story. Because it sounds to me what you're saying is they've got a lot of get out. Well, I, I would always check up on an agent, but yeah, if, mm -hmm. if you're if you're finding you're, you're checking up on them and they're no good, it's the wrong agent. It's the wrong agent. It's the wrong agent. And but, certainly but in the early days. If they're, like if they're good, I would still yeah. use the fact that you have a right to access your documents <coughs> that they are holding on your behalf yes. to see the tenancy agreements yes. and to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed yes. to be doing. Look, the, the, the key the key thing here. And, th and this is why the, the whole property sector has managed to get itself into trouble mm. and be treated as having an, a an accident. It is a business. It is no different from any other business or profession out there. At the end of the day, you're the managing director, you're the owner, and whilst you, yes, are entitled to rely upon other people's expertise, you need to educate yourself, you need to have checks and balances, you need to find out what the contracts, your redress uh, procedures are, and you need to make sure everybody involved understands you're running a business and that you offer the best possible service and tenancies that you can. You can't say, I was just passive in this, I thought I'd ma make some bucks, I didn't check up on who the agent was, and they don't service the boiler, and you get done for manslaughter. Ignorance no. is not bliss in this case. Correct. Right, next yeah. question. Do you want to put your hands up? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, we did talk a lot about rogue landlord and all that. Um, is there someone trying to help us to get to rogue tenants as well? Okay, mm -hmm. all lovely questions. Yeah. So mm -hmm. all the talk is about you horrible, naughty, rogue landlords. And this lady's quite rast uh, rightly asking, well, how do I protect myself against rogue tenants? Richard, do you want to start? Well, oh, this is a question that comes up a lot at landlord forums. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because a lot of the lobby, because there's, you know, between 9 and 11 million tenants, is in favour of tenants because that's where politicians want to win their votes. Mm. Um, I don't know very much about the likes of tenants' history and, and those sorts of databases that have information on uh, sort of rogue tenants that are repeat scammers. And certainly people like Landlord Action, I know, will be familiar with, um, you know, repeat scammers, etc. Um, but I, I think the way you protect yourself from rogue tenants is to make sure you do proper referencing. You can use NLA tenant uh, check. Um, so credit check, previous employer, previous landlord. And I, whenever I do use agents, actually, sometimes to find me tenants, I always ask them to... Uh, I always ask to meet the tenants before I agree to go forward because now I'm an experienced landlord, I can get a good feel for whether I think those people are going to be suitable. I always ask the question, who's going to be living at the property? And if they look at me gone out and say, well, just us, then that's the perfect answer. But if they then say, well, my girlfriend might move in and, you know, my mum's coming over from wherever and she might move in, then I know they might sublet. So, you know, it's so important for you. I've realised it's the most important thing in my business now making sure I'm really comfortable with my tenants okay. um, so that's the way to avoid the, the bad tenants I'll I give think. everybody a little yeah. go on this yeah. David anything from so the interesting one actually on this um, is the section 21 abolition 
Mm. Now, at the moment, there is no official database of bad tenants. There are lots of unofficial databases of bad tenants. However, would I get general agreement that the main reason people evict tenants is because they stop paying the rent um, or cause other damage that requires you to put your hand in your pocket to fix? Now, using a Section 21, it's a no-fault possession, therefore there is no court record. If you abolish Section 21 and have to go down the Section 8 route, you're probably all going to put in money claims along with the eviction claim, at which point, assuming the money claim is approved uh, and goes through the court as well as the eviction, that then starts creating county court judgments against bad tenants. And I can see if they do abolish Section 21, landlords will start using, obviously will be using Section 28, will be putting in money claims, tenants will be getting county court judgment, at which point the official register and judgment will become the best uh, bad tenant database in the country. And is that, does it, is, so GDPR, does it get over that? Does it, that become yeah, freely not, available? GDPR, it's, um, okay. I mean, I, this is a problem at the moment. One of the things that's been helpful to some extent about the Section 21 consultation is the ability of landlords to push back around this issue of poor tenancy, tenant quality. Um, currently, <coughs> if you take a money claim against a tenant for renters and evict them for renters, it doesn't go on the county court judgments no. database at all. Um, whereas if you take a debt claim against them, it does, which is a completely bizarre scenario. So one of the things that we're pressing for is, is a change to that structure. Um, court waiting times are currently ridiculous. The Ministry of Justice is crowing about having got it to 17 weeks, down one week. Um, and yet, and yet um, bailiff times have gone up twice by a week in the last two quarters running. So, and, and they're now suggesting in the, in the Section 21 consultation it will go down by a week. So up two, down one, not really an improvement for my mind. Um, what, what the RLA is pushing for is 10 weeks end to end in court. That's, that's actually what the court rules say. So I think the government should be aiming for, for 10 weeks, which is what the court rules say they have to achieve. But we're talking about how do, um, how, how do they prevent yeah. getting a rogue And, the, and then um, the other thing that, uh, the, the, the other two things that you're impressing on is, is actually making universal credit work properly. Mm. So at the moment, uh, if you're a social landlord um, and a tenant who's on universal credit disappears, you can still continue to take their rent arrears out of their universal credit, yeah. which you can't do as a private sector landlord. That wow. needs to change. Um, and the government has considered... That it How do they legally get away with that? Can you legally treat different... <laughs> well, different. yes, they yes. can. Obviously, <laughs> obviously <laughs> Basically, they can. can, but I don't but, get that. But because universal credit is a loan to the tenant, it's not a payment to a landlord. I okay. mean, uh, social, uh, social security, is, is generally speaking, is a payment to an individual to disperse, but it's not, it's not paid to landlords right. in, a, in a true sense. It's paid on, on the tenant's behalf. So, so there's movement there. And the last thing, of course, which is being done by a number of people in different contexts, is trying to get credit records mm. in general that is a good um, yeah. to actually reflect yeah. rent. And that's, and that's good for tenants because, of course, yeah. at the moment, if I pay my rent on time every month, um, it doesn't show up my credit record at all, whereas if I pay my mortgage on time every month, it does, which is extremely unfair to, yes, to good tenants. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, uh, it means that credit records aren't actually very useful in respect mm -hmm. to bad tenants because all their, their non-payment history doesn't show up at all. But okay. the, the challenge there is getting the data from us, from yep. myriad two million landlords across the country. I mean, Experian, I think, are the ones that have set up the credit files yep. now. Where, and, and you'll see if you look at your Experian's credit file, there is a space there now for rental payments. So, um, you know, if, you, if your landlord is recording your rental payments on that system, then they will show up. Mm. But it's just getting that rolled so out. So and some money, an money was made available mm. for yeah. Yeah. tenant we've referencing. We've tried agreements with, it, with Experian and other people yeah. to try and... Um, yeah. try and allow landlord data to get across, even yeah. from smaller landlords. And it, Quickly, Tony, yep, because I want uh, to move on. Sure. And, it, uh, and the, the simplest way of all, if they're moving from another landlord, ask who the landlord was, pick up the phone and talk to them. Mm. That will tell Which you sure an, an awful lot. Well, <laughs> clearly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which does happen. Does happen. Uh, where else have we got? Let me just, just all put your hands up so I know where you are and we'll try and fit everybody in. Yeah, we'll go to you first, sir. My question is, Okay, yeah, straightforward I, answers then? Um, it's difficult. Um, one, 
if you're being pursued by councils for council tax, you're not liable for it, so you need to fight back with the council. Yeah. Um, and have you done that successfully? Have they? Yeah, yeah they, they do eventually back off. Councils, uh, councils basically see landlords as, as an easy way to top up their coffers. Too often. Utilities will do the same and as well. Sometimes are, I've are had really utilities chasing me for money, and I know I'm not liable, and they've been very heavy handed yeah. about. But um, Ofgem off are very good about uh, dealing with those. Complaints. But didn't something come in on utilities that said? Was it oh, well, was it it's water? water, but only in Wales, so it doesn't oh, okay. apply in England. Water in, um, Wales, water, water, water in Wales, they can chase landlords for tenants, but um, only in Wales. Um, the, the other thing is, is there are plenty of tracing agencies out there. I tend to, to send to say landlords that, that debts are valid for six years, and I suggest you leave it for 12 to 18 months, and there are quite a lot of tracing agencies who offer no win, no fee tracing. Um, and the more information you have, the better. The, I always think that there are two great pieces of referencing. The best piece of referencing information you'll ever get is someone's bank statement. Yeah. Know what their bank details are. Uh, for, if for no other reason that you can then issue a claim against them at their last known address, which was the property address, get a judgment, and then go and do an attachment, uh, sorry, go and do a, um, a third party debt order and freeze their bank account and take the money out. And you don't need to know where they are for that. And getting an NI um, number yeah. as well. NI useful, number, and yeah. also an employer's reference, knowing where someone works. A pay, is, pay slip and a bank statement. This is all about referencing. This yeah. is why referencing at the start is so vital. Yeah. And why using referencing companies is, is part of a, pay, a picture, but it's not... You know, so many people just think, oh, I can use some 30 quid referencing yeah. company. It'll solve all my problems. It's not as simple as that. They are useful, but they're not the answer. Yeah, okay. And then, gentlemen, that was, that was helpful. Yes, sir? Yeah, we're seeing a Of the bill to rent. Does everybody understand what bill to rent is, or do you want me to give institutional a quick? investment? Yeah. So, it, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't help. So, it. Equally long word. So basically, <laughs> basically, it's big companies like Legal and General, and rather than just letting out a couple of properties here and there, <coughs> they're building two hundred properties, apartment block, and they're setting those up, and they're building them for long-term rental, yeah. and then they will rent all of those out, yeah. and it's a kind of pension fund. Interestingly. Abroad, you know, like we hear how marvellous Germany and all these other places are, that's because they kept their institutional investment. Um, and that's what a lot of landlords do over there. Whereas we lost it all in the late 60s. Um, and we then ended up with a very tiny private rented sector. But now it's kind of back. So it's very much a pension back fund investment. So um, that's what build to rent is. So Richard, do you want to start with build um, to rent? Yes, I mean, I would say certainly in London, and this is a market I know best, it, uh, you know, we do see quite a lot of blocks going up, but they are just a drop in the ocean in terms of the overall size of the PRS. So it's not like, say, you know, if someone tells you that student accommodation has become saturated in Leicester, you know, uh, w that's not what's happening with build to rent in London. I, th but I think it is about 15,000 a year they're expecting. So isn't it which is units yeah, which is which is tiny but the, for you as a landlord what's important is that to the bottom of your road yes yeah, so i was going to say london is is, a, Not is, necessarily. is about micro markets and you know if if your market is elephant and castle and you've just seen all of the build to rent uh, blocks go up there then I, I would be concerned but I, I think in a way build to rent is quite good because it may cause us to have to up our game because obviously the standard of them is quite high they too do tend to go for the top end of the market mm. don't they um, and certainly I think we've seen with HMOs they're more kind of hotel-esque and they've got um, mm. En suite bathrooms and so on, and I think all of that is partly because build to rent is is starting to ma improve things. Mm, yeah, I, I agree with you. I also disagree with you personally. I think the build to rent sector is going to have a very negligible impact on the actual private rented sector. We have all of the main build to rent are landlords within our membership, but I think. There is 120,000 built or planned at this point in time, which is That's a across drop the country, across yeah. the country, which is a drop in the ocean. Out of about four million rented. Less, less than one year of government government building need projection. Exactly. So we're talking a tiny, tiny percentage. Um, it's very sensitive as well to regulatory change. So a lot of them were that were looking in Scotland when they got rid of Section 21 in Scotland. Mm. I did have a fascinating discussion with a Scottish member of, member of the Scottish Parliament last year with 
they all seem to have dropped out. I don't know. I don't understand why they're still investing in, in England, but they've stopped investing in Scotland. I think like too uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the evidence session that I gave a couple of years ago. I think there are literally only two schemes or something. Yeah, it's tiny. Yeah. But, as Richard said, they're only going for the highest end of the market. Yeah. One of the things I argued, or I had thrown at me during an evidence session by uh, the Member of Parliament for Dulwich, um, was, well, the bill to rent don't charge for tenant fees during the tenant fees ban dis uh, discussions. No, but they charge about somewhere between 15 and 25% more in rent um, than an average property. So whilst I, ac I accept your point, even if they are at the I end of your street, mm. if you are a core market landlord, mm. they are not encroaching on your market. They tend to be very niche so as well. It's so kind so of just young just millennials, etc. Just to give you an example mm. of that, so TP is one that's in Wembley Park, and I was looking at their Lovely. rents yesterday, Massive. and I think two bed apartments were two and a half grand. Yeah. And locally, you and they were lovely. Don't yeah, get me wrong. Yeah, they're fantastic. Um, and I think it was a three bed for three and a half. But so, and you'd normally be looking at twelve hundred to kind of fifteen hundred. Mm. But I think as a result of that, what they will do is they will raise expectations and the standards of what tenants look mm. for. And that I do think will end. be that will. Well, I don't know. I think it will raise it overall. But I would you'd make one still final go and have a look point. at them, even if you couldn't afford one. Mm. Uh, we're <laughs> actually supportive of build to rent because they are servicing a market yes, need absolutely. Um, and there aren't enough houses. It's not diminishing the demand for your property. Agreed. There are demand vastly outstrips supply. And the only time the bill to rent is ever going to have any impact on the private rented sector is if supply outstrips demand. And you mentioned well, that, Germany. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Germany, the which is the, the height of the fantastic the wonders of the institutional investor and build to rent sector it's don't still only accounts for 40 percent of private rented mm. properties yeah. in germany so, so nowhere in europe does it outstrip 40 odd percent of the sector and 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 in here it doesn't even make 10 percent it's um, one yeah so it's, it's one percent and they're adding relatively small numbers and the other thing i would i would say is is one it's it's very specific it's it's basically here mm. and the olympic park <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and 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 the other point as well, of course, is, is Kirsty and Phil are right. Location, location, location. 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 Yeah. Uh, most build to rent stuff is, is at the moment, locationally pretty rubbish. And, and they're hoping that the location will be a location in 10 years time. There's, there's something else you can add to that. It's quality, quality, quality. Mm. The one thing the build to rent sector has got is very high standards, hence why they're going for more upmarket. Mm. And, we, and we are talking swimming pools and gyms when I was looking at this. Amenity oh, services, services, isn't it, basically? Yeah. 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 It's also customer service. It is customer it? service. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, I've it, heard it, that, you know, it's better. Tony, do a bit and then Thank we'll you. open it up. Most right, kind, Kate. So if you want good quality tenants who don't screw you over, who look after the property, who want to have somewhere safe and good to live, even on a short-term basis, wh 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 whether it's an HMO or an AST or whatever else, do the property up to the highest sustainable standard. Mm -hmm. you know, people will look after it. They don't even realise that they're doing it, but th th they say, oh, it's got a decent quality appliance. It's harder to break and they won't try and break it. So wherever, whatever sector you're in, from lodgings through the way, or, or, or all the way through to high-end uh, build to let, do it to the best standards, get good tenants, and you will not be affected to such a great degree by LNG upping its pension fund down the road, because it's different horses for different courses, and not everyone wants to live in that kind of block or your single house. There's well, room for it all. Yeah. I think one of my hobby horses is EPC ratings. Whenever you are doing anything to a property, make sure that you get that EPC mm. rating up as high as possible. Because remember, one of the actual hardest bills that tenants have to pay is not always the rent, it's the utility bills which are likely to carry on going up. Mm -hmm. And the lower your EP, the bet no, the higher, the better your EPC rating. <laughs> I'll get there. Uh, the lower their utility bills means, which means they have more in their back pocket to pay and afford your rent. So, don't mm -hmm. sort of. I know it's a little bit of legislation that came in, and I'm really disappointed that the government 
hasn't worked with the industry as we've asked them to, to really push what a fantastic win-win this bit of legislation could be for everybody. So get those EPC ratings up because the lower your heating bills are, the more rent for you. Uh, you've had the question, sorry, so I'll go to the gentleman behind. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on the, kind of the macro situation in the markets. Okay, so you're talking about the, as in macro as the property or economics or? Economics. Economics, yeah. right. Mm. Tony? Donut. <laughs> Donut economics, so you have to look at it in the round. Come what may, there <laughs> are... We need to be quick on this. Okay, got to get fine. It, Demand exceeds supply. We all need people to live, uh, somewhere to live. We're not making any more land apart from Iceland and the Galapagos. So you can look at it micro, macro, whichever ever way you want to turn the instrument. People need good quality homes over the head. Brexit, left wing, right wing, somewhere in the middle. Keep going, you're doing a good job. Okay. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, the, the people get very excited about Brexit and so on, and, and, and undoubtedly there is some slowdown in the economy, but a lot of that will lead to pent-up demand. There's, exactly. There are fewer properties available than people who want to live in them, and, and house prices, whatever people say, are not going to drop no. beyond a certain level. Um, so I, I don't see that there's any reason. I mean, an investment today in property is a good investment today, is a good investment tomorrow. Mm. I don't see any difference. Mm. Could you define a certain level? <laughs> well, you I, do, and also, I, so I don't think prices in London are going to drop. I think they might stabilize and yeah. sit static for a while yeah. there might be other places in the country that are doing better I'd, I'd be surprised if london house prices went through the floor i'm uh, it's certainly in very high value properties they are but that's yeah. a totally different discussion mm. and you have to bear in mind the northeast is they actually still haven't recovered their yes. house prices versus 12 years ago so it is there are kind of three markets there's a there's the london cambridge auction market that's kind of slowed now and kind of hit a bit of a peak and a buffer on affordability and you've got places like West Midlands where they're growing, but they're not growing anything like the rate they used to. And then you've got places like the North East where actually they've really flatlined, had one set of years where they had price increases and then they've never seen them since. So that, that's what we've seen. Also, David Smith did remind me that there is another David Smith who is an economist for the Times. Yes. And I have to say, as an economist that understands housing, he's one of the few that does. So um, that's somebody to follow. David and then Richard, any other thoughts? Again, I've got a great deal to add over, David. We have actually done a little bit of research on the impact of uh, Brexit on property values. Um, on the letting side, uh, and we used capital economics, actually, uh, to do it. Um, on the letting side, it looked like, effectively, there would be stagnation, um, maybe a little bit of negative growth which is actually what we are seeing uh, in London and other parts of the country. But we have to factor in that the property market is a ripple. Generally, what happens in prime central London ripples out across the country over the following few years. Um, prime central London has unquestionably been <coughs> hit hard. I was speaking to one agent. It was one of those, I really couldn't care less when he went, I, I'm shocked. I sold my six. I rented my sixty-five thousand pound a month uh, property. It only went for fifty-seven thousand a month. <laughs> I was like, "Get out! I just don't care." Um, uh, but for the rest of the market, it looked at the stagnation, and what it said was probably in the six to twelve months after that, it will then go up. Um, and we would, so we might have a bit of stagnation until we are out or not out, depending on what happens, uh, and then up. Same with property prices. So there was a dropping, and what it said uh, was about £2,500 drop in property values nationwide as a result of Brexit. London, about £7,500. Um, but that was only for the uh, kind of up to about 12 months after Brexit actually happens, at which point uh, Capital Economics suggested that because uh, the cost of building properties with both labour and materials will go up as a result of us leaving the EU. House prices will then start going up and we will see quite a sharp recovery of house prices. So Can effectively, they said, it's not going to have that much of an impact in the medium <coughs> to long term. And as landlords, you are medium to long term investors. These are, tend to be quite a good reports. So if you, can you remember the name of it? Not off the top of so my head. So if you go to the ARLA website... Put in the Capital <laughs> Economics, but these are really good reports. So Capital Economics and the Centre for Economic Business Research, CEBR, those are the two best economic organisations I've watched from a forecast perspective. So these reports are really, really worth um, 
uh, looking at because they do give you a good guide. Richard, yeah, final so word from you? It's all crystal ball gazing, isn't it? But I've been planning on the basis that at the next peak in the cycle in London will be mid to late 20s. And I guess that's just thinking on a technical basis, looking at how often we have um, drops in house prices, etc. But that's the feeling that I have having been in the market for 20 years myself. And just to add that I think changes to immigration post Brexit, I think, you know, could well affect the lettings market in London. I think they already have been over the last two or three years. We're certainly seeing changes in East London where all of my properties are just by, uh, you know, people are still coming from Romania and Bulgaria, but they're not coming from Poland or Central Europe um, or, or indeed Spain and Italy and France anymore. And there was a report that that's, um, bore that out recently. Okay. Great. Thank you. I hope this has been a good session. I hope you got something out of that. And thank you very, very much for filling it with your questions. Well done. Thank you. <laughs>